Hi, my name is Alan Tidwell, and I'm the director of the Center for Australian, New Zealand, and Pacific Studies at Georgetown University. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you today what's next in Pacific regionalism. And I do that in conjunction with my colleagues at the University of Hawaii's uh, Center for Pacific Island Studies. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And um, we just, um, I've got a little feedback here. I beg your pardon, I'm sorry about that. I just had some feedback on my end. Um, at any rate, it's a pleasure to welcome you today to what's next in Pacific Island regionalism. And uh, I have uh, four speakers uh, to join us today to discuss really um, a, an interesting challenge to Pacific Island regionalism. You'll remember in early February, leaders of the 18 member states of the Pacific Islands Forum met on Zoom to select a new secretary general. Henry Puna, former Prime Minister of the Cook Islands, won the vote on a single, uh, with a single vote majority over Gerald Zakios of the Marshall Islands. The splinter that erupted saw the five Micronesian states, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, Palau, Kiribati, and Nauru, begin the process of withdrawing from the forum. The initial cause of the break was the claim by the Micronesian states that a gentleman's agreement existed that would see the Micronesian elected as the next secretary general. Some members did agree and, that, and didn't agree and that split ensued. Clearly, however, the issues run much deeper. What will become of the Pacific Islands Forum? Can the Pacific Island Forum be repaired? Is this the end of Pacific regionalism? Can a better regional solution emerge? To discuss these, uh, these questions and more, our four speakers were first joined by the Honorable Gerald Zakios, Ambassador to the United States, representing the Republic of the Marshall Islands. The ambassador was nominated for the position of Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum. Prior to his service as uh, Ambassador to the United States, he was Minister of Foreign Affairs, and before that, the Attorney General. Following Ambassador Zakios will be former Ambassador Stephen McGann. He was ambassador to the republics of Fiji, Nauru, Kiribati, the Kingdom of Tonga, and Tuvalu. Hey, he was a career foreign service officer in the United States uh, Foreign Service. He was chargé d'affaires at the U.S. Embassy in Timor-Leste and was the director of the Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Islands for the United States Department of State. Following Ambassador McGann, we have Dr. Jerry Finnan, who has worked at the, in the Asia Pacific for over three decades. Currently, he's an adjunct professor at Cornell University and was the director of the East-West Center's Pacific Islands Development Program. His most recent publication is America's Pacific Island Allies, the Freely Associated States and Chinese Influence, which he co-authored with colleagues from the RAND Corporation. And from New Zealand is Anna Powells, the senior lecturer at the Center for Defense and Security Studies at Massey University, an associate scholar at the Macmillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. In 2019, she was a senior visiting fellow at the East West Center in Honolulu. She's written widely on New Zealand and Australian policies in the Pacific. I've asked each speaker to uh, talk for about 10 minutes, and we'll take each speaker in turn and then open the floor to questions. I will say that questions uh, will come in via the chat function, uh, sorry, rather uh, during the, um, uh, uh, the Q&A function, I beg your pardon. If you would uh, put them in the Q&A function, that would be helpful. It's easier for us to manage on this end. Please don't use the chat function for your questions. Ambassador Zakios, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, good afternoon, perhaps evening, to those that are on the uh, East Coast. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin by conveying appreciation and thank you, Alan. Uh, Georgetown University uh, Center for Australian, New Zealand and Pacific Studies, UH uh, Center for Regional Studies, uh, for the invitation to attend this and to share some thoughts on the topic of what's next in Pacific regionalism. Uh, it is also important uh, for me to convey my sincere gratitude to the presence and people of the Micronesian subregion for their unanimous support during my candidacy. Uh, 
I wish to congratulate the Secretary General Henry Puna on his appointment and wish him success in his tenure. Uh, I'd like to also begin uh, by, by a quote from the Bible, 2 Timothy 4, 7, that's, uh, and I read, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And I think uh, this is what we should be looking at and my thoughts today should be looking at. I, I, I believe that new inst institutional arrangements will strengthen the region not weaken it. Uh, I also like to uh, do a disclaimer to say the thoughts today are mine and I'm not necessarily represent those of, of the micronation uh, subregion and others. I'll speak to four uh, issues that I feel are important. Pacific Re first, Pacific regionalism as expressed through the Pacific Island Forum has serious flaws at the very time when effective uh, regional approaches are needed most. The reason why MPS leaders have signaled leaving the PIF and have begun to do so formally is over much more than a difficult election. The PIF has struggled to meet the demands of effective and dynamic regional approaches, which maintain policy control by member states. We have honestly struggled to take our homegrown priorities into the larger organization. We are often shunted off into smaller states grouping, the small island states, whose outcomes generally don't easily see the light of day. There is no clear sub-regional voice. The region has been told time and again that we are not on track to effective regionalism, including the 2013 Pacific Plan Review, headed by the recently uh, passed former PNG PM, Sir Miguel. Reforms seem to be continually studied, and these studies recycle more than there is the political will to implement them. In other words, we know and have been told time and again, we are on the wrong path to effective regionalism, and that we must rely upon more member states and subregions. We often wait for forum leaders to communicate to deliver regional and international policy statements. But in the modern day and age, the forum needs far more dynamic and nimble than annual outputs if cohesive regionalism is to take root. It can be well argued that in defining a unique pathway to regionalism, it is best to capitalize on the inherent advantages and priorities which small island nations offer and not to compete with heavy political infrastructures elsewhere. In other words, we are not the European Union and should not try to be either. Our path must be ours alone. While the PIF at times served to amplify leaders' voices, it is often hard to derive clear foreign policy on a multilateral basis because we have to work through traditional political blocks. It is frankly hard to take clear direction for climate negotiations to bring to the alliance of small island states when our outcomes are edited by metropolitan members. We don't have un, uh, uniform uh, voting positions at the UN on many issues. So we have a long way to go in pursuing cohesive regional identity on a global stage. Our cumulative frustration might be best expressed by a colleague ambassador of mine from our subregion, who, who was once posted in Suva who oftentimes would occasionally offer to host regional meetings in our micronation subregion. The offers were met by others with a quizzical question of how do we get there? With some threat of flight uh, pathways to our subregion, the ambassador would, would respond, well, how did I get here? You know, these are challenges and I have, uh, I have firsthand uh, first hand, uh, seeing this, having served in uh, also a crop agency, the Pacific community. So it is true that we, we often see these uh, within the premier regional organizations uh, and its crop agency. The opportunity for leadership at the top of the forum institution was intended very much as an opportunity to, to some 
of the very hard work needed for structural change of the forum to ensure it was fit for purpose. This wouldn't have been a, a business as usual continuation. When you can't see your own voice or role within an organization deemed to, uh, deemed to represent you, and an institution which may seem disinterested in pursuing much needed structural change, well, past a certain point, it is difficult to continue that relationship with an honest fix. Two, the decision by MBS leaders is clear, and it was clear and public well before the election. In fact, two years before. That was known by everyone in the PIF before votes were cast, and votes must have been cast by forum members with this end result clearly in mind. So at this stage, arm twisting or incentivized bilateral aid offers don't keep us in. Our cabinet as pronounced itself and the Nidizalar parliament, like two others in Micronesia region, will now be seized of this issue. And these decisions do not come lightly, nor without some profound sadness or disappointment. However, as all doors may close, no ones do open and may open. Make no mistake, leaving the institution does not mean we left the Pacific. Our islands haven't moved. We remain where we were before on the map. So we are open to engaging in diplomatic dialogue so others in the region and beyond can better understand our reasoning. And I also, and also discuss platforms where we can work in the future as a unified, solid region. Maybe there are platforms for joint statements or cooperation, as well as engagement with international partners. That just doesn't include the forum in its present form. I think it is also important to take the time before a final departure takes legal effect to address any potential gaps which may arise during this transition. In most instances, our memberships and engagement in other regional agencies and institutions remains unaffected. However, regional security architecture, including through the Forum Pikatawa and Buddhist Security a Declaration, is a clear issue for future engagement and transition. Other topics are likely to emerge as well. We want to broadcast our views in detail rather than rely on media messages. And we just spoke to this earlier, Alan. Uh, but there is there isn't an easy re-entry to the forum as an institution without including prior recommendations where needed. Three, while the US and Australia and New Zealand share a common worldview and close relations, the view of Australia and New Zealand and their relationship to the Pacific has been at times an imperfect match for our subregion. Economic integration is less attractive to our other underdeveloped and structurally challenged economies. It is important to note that none of the five North Micronesian nations have national standing armies. So in many ways, our closest perspective on the region and its relationship might be driven far more by security than trade. Having said this, I want to emphasize the vital importance of continuing to build stronger bilateral and sub-regional ties with both Australia and New Zealand. As the Marshall Islands, we are pleased to work closely with Australia serving together on the Human Rights Council in Geneva and have had high level communication recently with New Zealand on climate change, as well as gender, among other topics. And New Zealand has also been particularly supportive of fisheries development, not only in the Marshall Islands, but in the region and globally. At the same time, the PIF has often been more reserved on growing external security scenarios including expansionist avenues of PRC influence. Combined with general fragility and the growing role of non-traditional security drivers like climate change, our future looks difficult. A good history student will look at the last time we were caught between a geopolitical struggle. struggle. And as a sovereign nation, our national voices must be heard as a matter of principle. Sometimes the forum meetings might appear to be overshadowed by the antics of post-forum dialogue partners to the point where we forget that the entire purpose was forum dialogue uh, to hear and engage with the voices of Pacific small island nations on our own turf rather than to measure up to the expectation 
of larger powers. It has been suggested that a strengthened MPS offers opportunity for enhanced US engagement, in particular on security issues affecting the Micronesia subregion. This can occur in a means which also helps foster increased US engagement with the rest of the Pacific region as well. I have had the opportunity to connect my colleague ambassadors in the United States with the US government in this effort, including a recent approach to discuss the issue of climate change. I, building upon our own national experiences, it might, it might be important for the MBS leaders to have an opportunity, as I said, to address not only US foreign policy views, but also direct engagement with US Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, for the freely associated states, our compacts of free association are a clear basis of engagement. But this is also in the context of a wider regional security lens, both with our subregion and beyond. Perhaps a more structured and outcome-driven subregional and regional engagement or architecture with the U.S. can be pursued. So one could suggest reconsidering some of the media-driven groupthink that the Micronesian departure automatically creates destabilizing atmosphere or vacuum for wider geopolitical influence. To me, this might be a bit reactionary or presumptive. Rather, I would reframe this as new opportunities for focus upon building new platforms and means of engagement with international partners on our own issues, as well as theirs, and also an opportunity to build new sub-regional and regional dialogue with the United States in particular, including on security issues. Finally, the future of the Pacific regionalism can be as wide open as all the respective actors are willing to allow it. The decision of Micronesian leaders to leave the foreign institution is about more than just one election, more than Gerald, but a, wide, but a wider context where our voices are not meaningfully heard. Regionalism is the Pacific. Is the Pacific. It's not all dead, but needs some profound soul searching to consider why earlier recommendations and warning signs were not addressed. There are opportunities for further dialogue and joint activity with regional partners as well as to address and any immediate policy gaps during departure. There are perhaps some critical opportunities for to strengthen and build US relations framed around security issues and with particular outcome, which can start at the sub-regional level. It would be a clear mistake to consider Pacific regionalism somehow diminished, but rather it can ultimately be strengthened and improve the full political commitment to work together, which match by all. I thank you for the opportunity once again, and I look forward to uh, responding to any questions that um, others may have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. We'll turn now to Ambassador Steve McGann. And once again, I'd, I just encourage audience members, do lodge your questions in the Q&A section, and we will turn to those questions at the, uh, the end of our four speakers' presentations. Ambassador McGann. Well, thank you, Alan. Uh, and first of all, let me thank you again for bringing uh, this group together. Uh, this is an important webinar to have, particularly on the heels of the current situation regarding the Pacific Island Forum. But let's begin the discussion understanding that uh, we're not witnessing a failure of multilateral engagement in the Pacific, but actually the recognition of how important multilateralism is to Pacific peoples. Uh, the fact that uh, if you look at the history of the region, uh, starting with the Secretary of the Pacific Community, uh, the creation of the Fisheries Forum Agency, uh, the, how we began uh, the relationship with the United States uh, with the uh, Compact of Free Association, there have always been in the Pacific um, opportunities for Pacific peoples to engage uh, in multilateral organizations that they created. What's important for us to understand is not to tell them what to do, but to listen to them. And it's clear that in the case of the forum, uh, like with any other multilateral organization, there's always an opportunity to review, uh, reform and refresh. And so 
I don't think from the standpoint of the United States, uh, it's not a question of whether or not uh, the uh, Micronesian countries withdrew from the Pacific Island Forum. It's more of an issue, how do we have a constructive response to the decisions of Pacific Island peoples and why they come to the conclusions that they come to? So in, in, in this particular case, uh, with the forum, one could actually uh, beg the question as to whether or not uh, you should have rotating leaders uh, based on uh, sub-regional factions. All right, that's something that should be look, looked at, particularly at a time in which we all know that the deputy to the Pacific Island Forum is from the Marshall Islands. All right, uh, that's not a comment uh, about the election, but it is more uh, underpinning the fact that Pacific Island peoples have always found ways to cooperate in a multilateral arrangement. All right, and almost all of these have been successes. Uh, let's look at the universe, uh, University of the South Pacific as another example of a success. So from the standpoint of the United States, we have to look at how can the United States new interests in the Pacific, it's a rapid expansion because of adversarial competition. Uh, leading the way on that is of course, the relationship, the competition with China, but let's not leave Russia out of, the, out of it. How does the United States engage with the Pacific Island countries in a manner that meets the needs of Pacific Island peoples? Right? And it's clear doing that through multilateral arrangements uh, is a way to go. But that way to go may not necessarily mean uh, condensing all of these organizations into one. Right? We have to recognize that there are different priorities in different sub-regions. Uh, it, it's clear that the United States has an over and abiding interest in the North Pacific, right? It, as it renegotiates uh, the, the compacts of free associations, it needs to look at how it strengthens the existing treaties uh, with uh, Kiribati, the 1979 Treaty of Friendship, the 2013 Treaty on Marine Protective Areas, uh, and how to have a holistic view of dealing with the North Pacific. And it has to deal with the North Pacific in a multilateral context, simply because there are always complexities. The United States actually has a difficult time now in its bilateral relationship with Nauru because Nauru recognized Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, breakaway uh, republics from Georgia. So for the United States to engage in the North Pacific, with all of the countries of the North Pacific, it has to do so through a multilateral framework. That multilateral framework has to connect with the United States interests in the South Pacific. So they don't stand apart, but as they don't stand apart, they also have to meld certain realities. So we can't overlook the fact that the United States is not a bystander in the Pacific, it's also a Pacific Island country, right? You have the American territories of Guam. Uh, you have the, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Uh, you have American Samoa. You have the state of Hawaii, right? And so the United States has to deal with the Pacific in the context of how does all of its broader interests meet, all right? Fortunately, uh, the United States is able to engage uh, the um, Pacific Island countries with its territories in the context of the SPC, right? But it can't do so in the context of the Pacific Island Forum, because even though you may have uh, American territories from time to time sit as observers to the Pacific Island Forum, it's constitutionally impossible for them to ask to be members of the Pacific Island Forum because they can't have separate foreign policies as American territories, right? So the United States is always searching for mechanisms in which all of its interests can be combined and in a way that also meets the growing needs of Indo-PACOM, which has to figure out how to pursue the security of, uh, the national security objectives of the United States with the human security concerns of Pacific Islanders.
that can only be done through multilateral organizations. And so the task before us is how do we work with Pacific Island countries to make sure that the organizations that they foster and sponsor are sustainable and still continue to meet their overarching goals. Yeah, I would suggest, uh, I'm glad Jerry Finnan is on, on this call, that the United States needs to look at the resuscitation of the Pacific Island Conference of Leaders process, primarily because that also was a, uh, was a mechanism to include the important role that Hawaii has in the region. And the fact that we also recognize that there's a great deal of migration now between the Micronesian states and the state of Hawaii. All right. Uh, we also need to look at how to strengthen the Secretary of the Pacific Community, all right, which also, as I mentioned earlier, was another venue by which uh, the United States can play an active role. And at the same time, we have to look at the overarching policy role that the Pacific Island Forum has always played, all right, and how the forum has uh, become an immeasurable uh, opportunity for members who, uh, of, of, or rather countries who are engaged in the Pacific, who are not members of the forum, to actually interact in the context of the post-forum dialogue. So as we look through uh, this, this, this lens of multilateral engagement in the Pacific, we have to look at it in the context of not whether or not uh, the Micronesian countries were wrong or right to withdraw, uh, you know, not whether or not uh, there are still simmering uh, problems from the time in which the forum was originally called the South Pacific Island Forum, all right? But how do we overcome those things and to continue to uh, make multilateral engagement in the Pacific a much more constructive and useful tool to reach uh, the objectives and, and goals and aspirations of Pacific Island peoples in the context of dealing with much larger countries, right? And so as long as we're focused on how to do this constructively, I think we can continue to be a partner. But if we're going to be a partner, we then have to understand quite clearly that we have to work uh, in a multilateral context with Pacific Island countries in a manner defined by those countries, not necessarily defined by us. And that kind of gets to my last point that far too often uh, the larger countries of the region do not listen to Pacific Island countries. Uh, and I will accuse uh, not just the United States, but we often find Australia and New Zealand are guilty of that as well. So we have to promote opportunities so that we understand uh, that, uh, that these mechanisms work. And we can't pick and choose. You know, uh, the, you know, the Fiji-based Pacific Island Development Forum is an important tool. It's also an important tool that has been embraced by the countries of the North Pacific. At the same time, if we look at uh, rapidly changing trends in Melanesia, we have to understand that it's gonna be a specific engagement with the Melanesian Spearhead Group. That does not take away the importance of the forum, nor does it undercut the SBC, nor would it stop the United States from re-engaging uh, by resuscitating the Pacific Island Conference of Leaders process because each of these elements of multilateral cooperation play a specific role. I think what's important for us to work with Pacific Island countries to make sure that we have a clear definition of what each of these uh, institutions are, uh, have priorities that have to be met and objectives they're going to achieve. So if the forum is seen as a venue for policy discussions, that's where it sits. If the SBC is for implementation of economic development and environmental protection, we work with that. Obviously, fisheries protection and foreign fisheries agency is, is important. So again, the issue here is not to just criticize or uh, to just uh, uh, look at what had happened with the forum in a way 
that we say, oh my God, let's do hand wringing. The Pacific is falling apart. But in fact, to look at, to listen to what Pacific Island countries are saying and to adapt our outreach, our approach in a constructive way that allows us to strengthen the multilateral organizations that they have decided to create and not to pick and choose amongst them. And with that, uh, Alan, I'll stop. Great, thanks so much, Steve. Uh, Jerry, we'll, we'll turn to you now. Dr. Jerry Finnan from Cornell. Thank you, Alan, and good day to everyone. At the outset, I should convey that I agree with much of what has already been said by my distinguished fellow panelists. I started counting the other night, and I think I've had the privilege to attend more than 20 of the annual Pacific Island Forum meetings, and perhaps an even larger number of meetings of the Council of Regional Organizations of the Pacific. And so obviously that's influenced my, my thinking uh, quite a bit. As we know, the original regional architecture after World War II was centered around the South Pacific Commission or SPC based in New Caledonia. New, newly independent island nations found that participating metropolitan powers would limit the agenda to economic and social issues. Politics was ostensibly off limits, particularly subjects related to nuclear testing and decolonization. So the overreaching, the overarching structure of the Pacific's regional architect architecture changed significantly when the Fiji-based South Pacific Forum, today's Pacific Islands Forum, was established in 1971. As the new Pacific nations forged their individual foreign policies, the advantages of pooling ideas and sharing topics through regional collective action were already apparent. Ratu Sir Kamisese Mara once made a revealing observation when he wrote, quote, I have always held that a cardinal element in Fiji's foreign policy is regional cooperation in the South Pacific, end quote. Hence it was leaders such as Tonga's uh, Prince Tui Pelehake, Ratu Mara and others who took the lead in forging a more independent regional architecture. But from the forum's starting days, as has already been mentioned, Australia and New Zealand have been PIF members and until quite recently paid most of the budget. These two metropolitan nations have at times exercised strong leverage and influence, such as the appointment of Australian Greg Irwin as the Secretary General in 2004, very highly capable public servant and person who was very dedicated to the Pacific. But it's important to note that it was only under the leadership of Secretary General Dame Meg Taylor that the annual contributions of Pacific nations were raised to the point where Australia and New Zealand are not directly contributing the majority of PIF's annual operating budget. And I think that's an important change. In the 1990s, an agreement was reached wherein the SPC or Secretariat to the Pacific Community took primary responsibility for scientific and technical issues in a broad brush kind of way, while PIF's uh, Secretariat focused on political and policy issues. PIF today is the self-proclaimed premier regional organization of the Pacific, but a few other facts are worthy of note. First, there are more than a dozen other Pacific regional organizations that are part of the regional architecture, all doing very good work for the people of Oceania. In reality, PIF is but one among numerous important regional organizations. These include the aforementioned Secretariat of the Pacific Community with a staff of over 600 technical specialists on matters such as health and demographics. There's the organization known as Parties to the Nauru Agreement, which controls the world's largest sustainable tuna per seine fishery and collects tens of millions of dollars in annual revenues for the eight countries that are part of the uh, parties to the Nauru Agreement. And then, as uh, I think Steve mentioned, there's the University of the South Pacific, which is collectively owned by 12 nation states and has educated over 65,000 Pacific Islanders. Second, I think it's notable that PIF professional staffing is of extremely high caliber, but small in number. In my experience, there are, they are often loath to work with other more specialized regional organizations, 
because they think they are competing for donor funds or in some cases prestige. As a consequence, PIF's policy guidance has at times been poorly informed on important matters such as fisheries and public health. Third, it's important to note that the political linkages with the, freely, the three freely associated states in the North Pacific have always been tenuous, as the ambassador mentioned, as these nations, I think, have historical ties to the Philippines, Japan, and the US, which in a sense sets them apart from the Commonwealth tradition that's more uh, prevalent in, in the South. In fact, I recall, uh, and maybe uh, Ambassador can correct me on this, but I think after FSM, RMI, and Palau joined the Pacific, the PIF, as it's known today, it took some years and significant debate for the South Pacific Forum to change its name to the Pacific Islands Forum. Fourth comment of note is that there is some question today, some serious question about what kind of organization the PIF has become. It is no longer strictly an organization of self-governing and independent sovereign nation states, as was the case as at its founding. Around 2016, it is said the PIF was pressured to allow two French jurisdictions, French Polynesia and New Caledonia, to have full voting membership. This potentially opened the door to US territories in the state of Hawaii, not to mention Pitcairn and Rapa Nui. Full inclusion of non-independent island territories has strengthened and weakened PIF as an international organization. While PIF's voice is now more inclusive, it may result in some confusion, for example, if there are international summits organized by PIF with Pacific presidents and prime ministers, but also including governors of US jurisdictions such as Guam and American Samoa. This ambivalence about membership is apparent on the PIF's website, which proclaims, quote, today we are 18 full members plus associate members and partner states. Our success, however, is not just measured by our membership because this is not a club. It is measured by our accomplishments because we are a forum of sovereign nations confronting serious challenges in our region, end quote. So where does this leave us? To be sure, the PIF, like all institutions, has had its challenges, its share of successes and failures, or what uh, Sir Jeffrey Henry used to say, its joys and its woes. It is notable that to the best of my knowledge, PIF has never been able to convene a collective summit meeting of Pacific leaders with either the President of the United States, even though four such events have taken place in Hawaii, or with the President of the People's Republic of China. There have been awkward moments for the PIF. Most of you will recall that after the Bainimarama coup and prompted largely by Australia, PIF in 2009 suspended Fiji. Fiji then established a rival regional organization excluding Australia and New Zealand that is still in existence called the Pacific Islands Development Forum previously mentioned. Only in 2019 did Fiji's prime minister re-engage with the PIF by attending the annual meeting in Funafuti concluding a 10 year hiatus. It may also be helpful to our understanding to recall that there have been previous points of friction regarding the secretary general's position. Fiji's periodic desire to nominate a Fiji citizen candidate has caused consternation because there was said to be a gentle persons agreement that if the PIF headquarters was established in Fiji, then Fiji would not nominate one of its own for secretary general. If one examines who has held the SG position since 1971, there's been some tension over whether it's preferable to have a former Pacific Island national leader, such as Eremia Tabai, or senior, a senior Pacific official from the public service, such as Noel Levy. There has also been some uneasiness about the ability of larger Pacific nations to incentivize the SG selection process. For example, I remember at the 2014 PIF meeting in Palau, PNG's foreign minister offered the small island states subgroup a site for offices to be established in Port Moresby if the SIS group subgroup would support their candidate. That's something, of course, it would be much more difficult for smaller nations to do. 
Despite these challenges, it is in my view indisputable that the greatest enduring strength of the PIF has been its convening power during the annual meeting when high level representatives from international organizations and dialogue partner nations arrive from all corners of the globe to interact directly with Pacific leaders and their ministers. This remarkable feat brings a valued efficiency to international diplomacy and projects a positive image on the world stage. And it should not be forgotten that the PIF is one of the only organizations globally that annually brings both the PRC and Taiwan to the same gathering, though never at the same table. On major global issues, the PIF megaphone has been critically important with its strongly unified positions on nuclear arms, chemical weapons disposal, and climate change, giving the region a far larger voice on the international stage than any individual Pacific country could ever sustain. The Blue Pacific Continent theme conceptualized and articulated by the forum is currently resonating across all the world's oceans. Looking and looking for a way forward presently, it's important to keep in mind that the region has a number of significant strengths. Taken as a whole, the Pacific Islands region is standing tall, thanks in part to all that the PIF has facilitated and supported. For instance, every member of the PIF is a working, albeit imperfect democracy that regularly holds free and fair elections. What this suggests to me is that the Pacific leaders have time honored deliberative norms and shared identities that may be brought to bear in resolving the current troubles. Useful ideas are being floated by Pacific leaders each day. For example, establishing a more formal procedure for selecting the SG that might include shortening the SG's term to a maximum of three rather than six years to provide more opportunities for rotation of the SG position. To get over the disrespect and marginalization some Micronesian leaders feel, another idea might involve identifying another venue or regional organization to at least temporarily take on responsibilities for convening the annual region-wide Pacific leaders meeting. It would be a pity to see that suspended. What is clear to me is that there is at this time little scope for direct involvement of non-member metropolitan states in resolving PIF's intra-regional dispute. In concluding, the main point I wish to make is that although it may take some time for the wounds to heal and a new process for SG leadership selection to emerge, there are far more practical, historical, and culturally resonant reasons for the Pacific to unify than there are reasons to allow fissures to deepen. And for that reason, I'm optimistic about the PIF and about the region's political future more generally. Thanks, Jerry. That was a, uh, a wonderfully optimistic view of the world and uh, I, I endorse it wholeheartedly. Thank you. And so now let's talk, let's uh, turn to uh, uh, Dr. Anna, Anna Poles from um, Massey University in New Zealand. Anna, over to you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Tenakoto Katoa, I'd like to begin first by uh, thanking our hosts, um, Alan Tidwell at Georgetown University and Tarsisius Kawatalaka at UH Manoa um, for convening this panel on, on Pacific regionalism after a particularly bruising uh, three weeks uh, in the Pacific, as my fellow panelists have, have outlined. I would like to build on their comments by highlighting three points that bring us back to sort of first principles of regionalism and draw focus uh, on the regional security and geopolitical implications of what has happened over the past few weeks. So first I'd like to begin by saying that, that in, in my opinion, I, and I agree with a number of the, the panelists here, uh, that this is not the end of Pacific regionalism. Regionalism in the region is not static. Um, the regional architecture that is in place in 12 months time, um, the period in which the Micronesian states have to undertake the withdrawal process from the Pacific Islands Forum, it may look different and it does need to look different uh, from what we have today, but the regional project itself is by no means over. Uh, and as Micronesian member states know all too well, there's far too much at stake in terms of the issues. So regionalism and multilateralism as, as mechanisms are central to Pacific representation. And there's an opportunity here to overhaul the regional architecture, to consider, to consider equitable representation across the region, and also to define 
the requirements of leadership now, 50 years after the South Pacific Forum, as it was called then, was established in 1971. So this is an opportunity to, uh, in the words of, of Māori academic Ranganui Walker, uh, for forum members to sit in what he called productive discomfort and work through these issues uh, that are, are so critical to the region moving forward. Over the past three weeks, we've heard a great deal about regionalism and the importance of it and collective action. As James Movick, a former uh, Director General of the uh, Forum Fisheries Agency and from FSM, has recently written, the prestige and projection of regionalism is based on unity and strength. And as another senior Pacific official has said to me in the past week, unity and security were and remain the elemental forces driving the forum and the region. And arguably the confluence of factors that led to the formation of the forum in 1971 are similar to those 50 years later. Agency, Pacific voices and representation, traditional and non-traditional security threats, and great power competition. And we see these laid out in the 2018 Boy Declaration. In the past five years, underpinning many Pacific conversations are the justifiable concerns at wider geopolitical tensions and the responses to strategic competition within the region will, by accidental design, shape or undermine Pacific regionalism with the potential to seriously impact the regional architecture. So as these old and new threats have emerged and returned, the risk has been that Pacific states' interests and ideas will be crowded out. Here, the forum and its members have demonstrated over the past few years that regionalism can act as a buffer, a front line, not a fault line, to these threats and challenges. Sometimes there have been cracks in the regional fabric, but these have also, there have also been successes. And in all cases, the region has shown its resilience, the ability of the region's members to reassess, regroup, and come out stronger. But part of that resilience is based on the layers of architecture and networks, formal and informal, in and across the Pacific region. And these are fundamentally important now to resolve these issues. So my second point is that there is a temptation to cast the forum split in the context of strategic competition, particularly Sino-US competition. And this has been done several ways over the past few weeks. First, by allegations that China has sought to pressure foreign member states and influence the outcome of a growing concern that Micronesian states would continue their push as laid out in the 2019 Micronesian President Summit's communique for Taiwan and China to be treated as equal diplomatic partners in the region, including at the forum to which China is a dialogue partner and Taiwan holds the status of development partner. Second, are the allegations and accusations that ge geopolitical imperatives drove the vote. A number of leaders and commentators have publicly claimed that Australia and New Zealand voted along the geopolitical lines. Palau's president, for instance, suggested in a recent article in The Guardian, where he questioned whether Australia and New Zealand realistically share the same interests as small island developing states. He also questioned the role of outside influence in decisions made by, in quotes, the Pacific. President Whips asked whether the Marshall Islands relationship with Taiwan hurt its candidacy in the South Pacific and potentially also Ambassador Zacchaeus's relationship with Washington. These claims, some of which have been unhelpful, others have lacked potency, others have been of, of, of considerable interest, interest do however warrant some testing. And this demands a deeper consideration of the way in which Canberra and Wellington frame the region and regionalism itself, the advantages and disadvantages of having a Secretary General from the South, particularly the Cook Islands, given its constitutional relationship with New Zealand versus the North, the modes of engagement and architecture that they each prioritize, the degree to which alliances and, and strategic partnerships informed their decision-making, and whether Australia and New Zealand voted as a bloc or whether this is an example of growing divergences between the two countries. There is a subtle but notable distinction between Australia's Pacific setup and New Zealand's Pacific reset. Australia has certainly prioritized the region from a strategic viewpoint, but its engagement has, has had a strongly bilateral framing, including attempting to build a hub and spokes type security architecture through bilateral security treaties, defense cooperation, and other means. New Zealand in contrast has focused most strongly on regionalism, specifically the forum, not surprising given New Zealand's 
reliance as a small state on multilateralism, but neither country have necessarily put too much focus on sub-regionalism. In response to the outcome of, of the secret ballot, Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade said in a statement that it understood the, the disappointment of Micronesian members. Diversity and regional representation are critical to the forum, they said. And we, Australia, encourage all members to work together to find a path forward. Foreign Minister Maurice Payne further stated, our absolute priority in the Pacific at this stage, in such complex times and in such challenging times, given COVID-19, absolutely needs to be to protect unity. Payne has said that Australia's partnerships with Pacific nations would continue regardless of the decision made by Micronesian leaders. New Zealand Prime Minister Ardern has said that New Zealand would lobby dissenting nations to remain, saying that we're going to do what we can to encourage leaders to stay and that the strength of the Pacific Islands Forum is its wide representation and of course we want to see that remain. Foreign Minister Nanaya Mahuta said that it was regrettable that countries had planned to pull away and that she expected that there will be a high level of conversation amongst leaders to see whether or not we can work to bring everyone into the regional collaboration through the PEV. New Zealand certainly threw its support behind Puna after it was clear he had won the posting, Mahuta further said, but would neither confirm nor deny whether New Zealand had voted in, in the secret ballot, stating, we made a determination on who we thought might promote regional co cohesion. In a statement that was reported in the media at the time by Mahuta, and came across as slightly disingenuous was her saying that we were well aware during the conversation that the Micronesian states had a candidate that they were strongly in favor of. There was no indication until after the PIF that they intended to pull out. Yet in truth, we all know that Micronesian member states had made their intentions clear at least 18 months ago, culminating in the 2020 Micronesian President Summit and the Mikrios communique, which warned that Micronesia saw no value in participating in the forum should it fail to honor the existing agreement on sub-regional rotation. But to claim the result of, of the vote as a consequence of geopolitical chess game in which Pacific states are mere pawns reflects a long-standing failure to acknowledge or understand the agency of Pacific states themselves. It shows a lack of understanding of how national interest drives regionalism. It fails to capture the tensions between national interest, sub-regional dynamics and the region. Which brings me to my third point. Setting aside the geopolitical drivers of the leadership outcome, there are certainly geopolitical implications that need to be considered. And this brings me back to my first point about regionalism being a buffer, the front line of resilience. A recent Australian media report, of which there had been many, suggested that a split in the Pacific Island Forum's ranks could provide an opening for China to boost its influence in the region. Now, certainly, certain countries may wish to exploit or explore, perhaps, the geopolitical dividends as a consequence of the split and seek to shore up greater influence. China would certainly not be the first country to have sought to do so in the region and certainly won't be the last. So what is China's perspective on, on, the, on the recent events in the forum? We can turn to comments made by uh, Zhou Fangyan, a professor at the Guangdong Institute, Research Institute for International Strategies, who wrote in the Global Times, the well-known mouthpiece, that Palau's walking out of the forum may be an attempt to avoid more pressure from Washington and Canberra, and it symbolized the declining influence of Western countries over Pacific nations and that China is only concerned that particular countries in the region are so-called diplomatic allies with Taiwan and had no interest in the greater strategic competition, whilst also noting that Pacific countries do not want to be Washington's vanguards. So the question, if we consider the geopolitical implications is who is of benefit here? And arguably the departure of, of the five Micronesian states uh, which includes the last four of Taiwan's diplomatic allies in the Pacific, Nauru, Marshall Islands, and, and Palau. Um, Kiribati, also Micronesian state, obviously having switched in 2019. The departure of this block, of aspect parts of this block, could also lessen Taiwan's influence in the region. 
of the 12, those 12 remaining PIF members, only Tuvalu would recognize Taiwan. And a recent article suggested that, that this could potentially mean that Taiwan may actually be the greatest loser out of this from a geopolitical perspective. And the support of Taiwan's Pacific allies in the forum enabled it to better defend its international recognition and to counter Chinese efforts to undermine and alienate it even further. Now, of course, we can talk about also the, the potential benefits for the US, but I, 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 believe, I feel that uh, Ambassador McCain has, has covered off on those uh, extremely well. The question though is going forward, if we recognize the, the tensions between sub-regional and regional levels, if we recognize the importance of leadership at a time where there are the complexities of the region, both those at the local and national levels, as well as the broader geopolitical tensions, leadership of the forum is absolutely critical, as is leadership of the sub-regional uh, groupings as well. So this is an opportunity to reset the forum, but to do so, we need to consider, for instance, the 2050 strategy, uh, which is an opportunity for transformative change and could be the vehicle and mechanism for doing so. Uh, Fiji has certainly signaled it, it is keen to take the lead um, here, including the review of regional architecture. And this is perhaps a role that, that if interested, uh, some of the Micronesian states could also participate as well, uh, regardless of, of um, their, their decision at the end of 12 months. So the kids question here too is who are the regional brokers who can work together in formal and informal settings across the region to find a, a resolution uh, to this, which enhances the mana uh, of all partners and parties in, in the Pacific. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. That was wonderful. So we've now um, heard from our four presenters and I just wanted to uh, now turn to the audience, the Q&A from the audience. And to uh, uh, first mention that uh, we have a note from the president's office in the Federated States of Micronesia, just to say that President Panuelo is um, watching and uh, enjoying the discussion very much. So um, it's, it's great that we have a, a, an involved audience uh, at a distance and they're letting us know that they're watching and that the president is appreciating the comments that he's heard here. That's terrific. Um, Ambassador Zakios, you've got a number of questions uh, that have come in. And I think what I'd like to do would pack some of those together if I could. You know, broadly speaking, the, the departure of the Micronesian states uh, from the PIF may put pressure on associated agencies like uh, the crop agencies. Um, and it also might impact the capacity for Pacific Island states to negotiate uh, with uh, uh, and achieve development goals. Could you make some comments, please, about what you think the impact of Micronesia's uh, departure from um, uh, the five Micronesian states' departure from PIF will have on those crop agencies and the capacity for them to do work, the capacity for the Micronesian states to participate. Thank you, Alan, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, you know, I, I, I see the, uh, the different crop agencies uh, have been established uh, separately outside of the four. Uh, for example, I'll give the Pacific community was established uh, by an, another international agreement, which includes not only sovereign countries, but territories as a whole. So include, um, and this works uh, also for the, for the foreign fisheries agency and including the secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program. So to say that it will weaken it, I, I, I bet to disagree that that will it may still continue to create some uh, challenges, but I don't think that you will see a weakened participation of the countries uh, in, in all this. It might also give a better opportunities for, for, uh, for addressing the issues that really matter most. Uh, in, in the international multilateral, all, all these issues uh, uh, are discussed in the multilateral arena. I spoke to this issue a little bit. And as I said at the UN, even us as called ourselves Pacific Island Forum, we're not together when we address issues. 
So to say that it will affect it, I think uh, one of the things that we talked about reform is we should consolidate how we approach all issues, both within the region and in the multilateral arena. So that's how I would approach addressing that, that question. Uh, I thank you. Great. Thank you. And, and I wonder, would have any of the other panelists like to come in on that? Any comments regarding the other agencies or, or shall I move on? Okay. Um, Ambassador uh, Zakios, I've got another question and this is from uh, journalist uh, Bernadette Carrion Brooks uh, from Palau. And she asks kind of a tough question and I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase it slightly. But let's, let's do a thought experiment here. Let's put you in the position as Secretary General of PIF. And now you're talking to Micronesian leaders about why they should stay in PIF. What would you say? Uh, um, you know, as I, as I, uh, I started my comments, I, 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 I stated that this, this is an opportunity for us to, to take a pause and, and to address uh, issues that can really develop on, on the importance of this uh, premier regional organization. And I, I don't think uh, it, it should be seen as, as weakening the PIF. Rather, the micronation uh, or sub-region's decision to withdraw was to the core of what needs to be addressed, not only of the election process, but on the whole of the important reform that requires to be done to the structure of this so that every membership and every participation should be equal and, and address the key issues that we have all talked about today. So that's how I would approach uh, ad addressing that question. So. Okay, thank you. Um, Ambassador, I've, I've, I've got one more that's, that's I think aimed pretty much at you. And uh, it's really from uh, Kara Miller from the uh, COFA Alliance National Network, a social justice nonprofit organization based in Oregon. And Kara is wondering, just in the broad, how should the um, uh, diaspora people from uh, the COFA states living in the United States, how should that diaspora think about and address the question of uh, Micronesia's challenges uh, with PIF. Is there a role for a diaspora population? I think if we look at the work of, of the existing structure of the forum, there is a role for every, uh, for participation of all uh, members uh, of the citizens, citizenry of all the members. Uh, you have, of course, uh, there's also, in fact, if I, I have to speak of the Fijian diaspora, in the United States is probably as greater numbers than the Marshall Islands diaspora in the United States. So to ask the question, I think everybody uh, that can contribute uh, in, in, a, in a way to the ongoing strength and growth of their regional organizations and their communities should be able to participate. Great, thank you. So I'm now turning to a question from Dominic Godfrey with Radio NZ Pacific. And uh, Dominic is asking this question directed specifically at Ambassador McGann, though I think we could probably open the floor up beyond that. But also, Steve, the, Dominic asks, how can the US and the PRC work in a more complementary way with regard to the development and climate resilience priorities of the Pacific rather than in competition for influence? Oh, that's quite a question. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not quite sure I, I have the answer, but let's start with the fact that there have been opportunities elsewhere, for instance, in which the United States and China uh, have tried to work together. For instance, in Timor-Leste, there's a trilateral agricultural project that most people don't know exists. Right? I, I think what we have to do is understand First, China's intent in the in the region, in the Pacific, right? And start with the perception that it might not be as ominous as is being portrayed. That's one thing. Uh, secondly, we also have to understand that many of the inroads that China made in the region was because of the fact that there was a vacuum created by the United States not paying closer attention to the region. So 
in a situation now where the United States is re-engaging, that concept of competition is even much more enhanced. But if we look at what's happening on the ground, all right, then we see, again, the United States um, renegotiating the uh, compacts of free association, the move toward closer relations with Kiribati, the fact that the relationship between Fiji and the United States has grown stronger, not weaker. Uh, we've seen just in, this, in, in, in one year, we've seen trade agreements between Fiji and the United States. We've seen uh, a new uh, defense cooperation uh, agreement, not a security agreement, but a training agreement. Uh, we also see the fact that the United States is engaging more in Melanesia, uh, working more closely in Papua New Guinea, thinking about uh, strengthening its uh, posture in the Solomon Islands. So I think we can't somehow assume that the United States' new interest in the region is just solely because of competition with China, right? And if we start from that standpoint, we might be able to find areas in which there could be uh, Chinese US uh, 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 cooperation. It could be that uh, cooperation uh, when it comes to COVID vaccines it could be one area because uh, although, uh, for instance, China may have the ability to deliver more vaccine, the United States may have a, a better capability of building an infrastructure for, the, for vaccinations. So I think we can look for areas in which we can cooperate, but I don't think we should just, you know, misinterpret uh, the role of the United States as one that's always solely adversarial when it comes to China. But in fact, what's, what's happening right now is that the United States is moving away from an I'll hold your coat position uh, in the region to much more active engagement Again, obviously, largely because uh, there, there are national security reasons for doing so, but all of those reasons can't be seen uh, in the context of competition with China. And we can identify those areas in which there could be cooperation. Uh, I, I, I think uh, there's, there's a possibility, for instance, of cooperation uh, in, in the field of education. I mentioned agriculture. Uh, the possibility of, of COVID eradication. There are a number of areas in which we can cooperate. Um, and I think the United States would, would be willing to identify those areas, but it's also important for the rest of the world, not just to see the United States engagement with Pacific Island countries as solely engagement uh, just to counter China. Now, other panelists, would you like to come in on that, Anna? Uh, thanks, Alan. I would just like to, to add a couple of points to um, Ambassador McCann's points there. I think it's, a, it's fundamentally important to remember, too, that Pacific Island states, um, those who, uh, who recognize China, have sought to engage with China as, as sovereign actors when they sought to diversify their foreign policy uh, driven by national interest, not necessarily because there was a vacuum as such, but rather because they were seeking to diversify their partners. Um, and, and that had much to do actually with Australia and New Zealand primarily. So we need to understand and, and respect the fact that there is a to a degree, a, a level of a consensus, of a China consensus in, in, in parts of the Pacific region. And this has been thoroughly uh, well articulated by Dame Meg Taylor, uh, who has spoken about not choosing between uh, United States and, and, and China, or often more realistically between Australia and, and, and China. So there are opportunities for engagement for the US to step back into the region um, more consistently, uh, certainly um, would make a significant difference. Uh, under the Biden administration, you know, in terms of his looking for potential off ramps, uh, climate change offers that, and that could be an area, as the ambassador has indicated, and for greater engagement with, with China. Uh, and there are a number of, of trilateral pro development projects in the region with Australia and China and, and New Zealand and China and Pacific partners. Um, so there is that opportunity, but the US 
a considerable portion of the of the focus of its re-engagement has been around that security cooperation element. And you wouldn't want that re-engagement, that Pacific pledge to uh, resemble what happened with the pivot in Southeast Asia, where that security cooperation pillar was, was, was dominant, um, but the diplomatic had yet to follow up with that. So it, that will be certainly the challenge, will be marrying up uh, the military and, and marrying up essentially Indo-PACOM and State Department to ensure that there is a consistent degree of engagement that isn't reactive, that isn't simply responding to strategic imperatives and anxieties, uh, but rather a far more consistent engagement that's driven by Pacific priorities. Great, thank you. Jerry or Gerald, did you want to come in on that? You're good? Okay. So Tess newton Kane has asked, um, given that the wider membership of the PIF has indicated the desire that the Micronesian countries remain in the organization, this puts those countries, the Micronesian countries, in a strong negotiating position. How can they best capitalize on this? Gerald, I think that's, that's a good place for you to start. So, sorry, um, Alan, I, 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 I was doing something. I kind of missed the, the question you... Yeah, sure. So um, Tess newton Kane in uh, Queensland has asked, given that the wider membership of the PIF has indicated the, the desire for the Micronesian countries to remain in the organization, this puts those countries in a strong negotiating position. She asks, how can they best capitalize on this? Um, if we, we go back to the history of, uh, of the Pacific Island Forum, um, there, um, there have been discussions of, uh, and we have seen just recently in, in Pompeo where uh, other members have joined the Pacific Island Forum, namely the, the territories, the French territories of New Caledonia and then French Polynesia. Uh, obviously, uh, I, I, if I recall correctly, at uh, some uh, forums many years ago, uh, there were interests by the US territories to, to also become part of this organization. I think this has, has created an opportunity. Uh, in terms of leverage, I, I, I think the real leverage that the Micronation president uh, subregion is really looking at it is, is to be included in, in the important work that, that needs to be done there. So I think the Micronation subregion has actually a contribution to what a, a strengthened Pacific Island Forum architecture, as some uh, others have said, should be looking like, should look like, because they have seen how they have been part of this organization until recently, uh, having uh, from when they're joined. So I think that will be the, the their contributions uh, in into how the structure and the architecture of the forum the, must be something that will need to be uh, carefully. Uh, addressed by, by others. And some of the leaders have, have said and acknowledged that, and some of the speakers have acknowledged that, that there is a, a, a good opportunity for Micronesia to, to provide uh, and share its, its, uh, its uh, involvement in the work of this region. Especially if you look at Micronesia, five of these countries, ironically, when it comes to security, it was in Bikatawa in Kiribati and Bowie in Nauru. And all two of the champions of these uh, are now uh, looking at withdrawing from a very important issue. But if you look at the, uh, the uh, 2050 strategy, it touches on oceans and five of nine members are from Micronesia. So there is a real uh, element of their contribution to the important work of this regional body. Just, just building on that, uh, Richard Pruitt um, has asked, uh, uh, I think it's a nice question, it's a nice follow-up. He says, you know, without participation of the Micronesian nations, the forum would now seem to be a sub-regional body uh, with a weaker role a a as a policy-making body. What is now appropriate, what is now the appropriate level for Washington's representation to the post-forum dialogue? And I think he's really asking is, is you know, it, Without the Micronesian states, is is it a player in the way that is the PIF a player for Washington in the way that it was with the Micronesian states in? Um, I guess if if that question is uh, asked of me again, I, I'd like to say that it should not be mutually exclusive. 
because uh, the role of, as I, as I have uh, always pushed, the, 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 the role of the engagement of the U.S. should be at the highest level where possible. And we have seen two forum meetings where that has happened. I think that should continue to happen. Uh, but at the same time, it should also uh, be able to do the same with the sub-regional group. Steve, I think you wanted to jump in there. Yes. You know, Alan, I have long advocated uh, that the United States uh, should create a special envoy for the Pacific position, uh, just so the United States could engage uh, at a multilateral uh, level throughout the region with uh, consistency and continuity. It is it's a bit too difficult for the United States to uh, engage bilaterally in the region. Uh, and, and so by working in a much more effective manner at an appropriate level, not at the deputy assistant secretary level, which uh, basically still focuses on bilateral relationships, but at a special envoy level, similar to the fact that the United States has a special envoy for the Great Lakes in Africa, all right, which is a regional job that having a special envoy uh, for the Pacific that focuses on these multilateral institutions would also work in parallel with Indo-PACOM's initiatives, which sees everything in a regional context. So that's how you begin to marry the State Department with the Department of Defense by having engagement at an appropriate level through the right institutions. And in, and in that way, if I could just add, in terms of working with uh, Pacific Island countries to their institutions in an open fashion actually brings greater leadership and it actually puts the United States at an advantage over China, right? And we also, one thing I'm going to close out of this on China, we always have to remember that, uh, you know, Deng Xiaoping did not have a map on his office saying that the Brick Road Initiative would end the new Kukulofa. As a matter of fact, he didn't have a Brick Road Initiative. But the, the point being is that we have to look at China's interest. China's interest in the region started with the competition for diplomatic recognition, right? And it used that competition to exploit differences within the region. But China doesn't necessarily want to have a, a, a naval base in Vanuatu which is also kind of silly if you think about it. So I think that if we had uh, appropriate representation by the United States engaged in the region, all right, uh, in a multilateral context, it would be able to see more clearly, you know, what elements and what areas it should work on that would be consistent with its overall policy objectives and at the same time meet the competition from China. Great, thank you. Jerry or Anna, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, Jerry? If, if I understood uh, Richard's question correctly, uh, there's some doubt about whether the high level of representation that is desirable could be achieved with three meetings per year rather than, than one meeting per year, whether there's that much interest and in, in attention. And so my sense of it is, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, the ambassadors would have some further thoughts just uh, about how to ensure that the annual meeting continues to be whatever meeting and whatever venue, whatever organization sponsors it, but that there be a, a platform for the Pacific Islands nations as a whole to, to come together, to dialogue, to share ideas. Uh, because once uh, it's divided into three smaller groupings, I, I just don't think uh, the voice is going to be nearly as loud and clear on the international stage. Okay, Gerald or Anna? Um, yes, Alan, I, I think that's a very important question on, on uh, post-form dialogue partnership and, and engagement. Yes, I agree that uh, it should not be an annual event, number one. Number two, I think it should be an event that is part of the overall leadership engagement not just relegated to the side where, you know, uh, you have, you're asking for high level interaction and then leaders 
uh, do not attend that same meeting. So I think it, it should be an opportunity where there is a stronger engagement from both sides. But it, I, I fully agree with Gerard that it, it should be an event that it's not every year you come and then have that post form dialogue partner. I think there should, must be some continuity and measurement of what, what has been achieved during these dialogues over the course and before another engagement is, is uh, taking place in another form. Thank you. Anna, did you, did you want to come in? Sure. Thanks, Alan. I, just, to, just to add to that, I do, I agree that there, um, that there are real dangers in watering down the architecture and diluting it because the impact that could have in terms of the ability of the region to achieve what it has achieved internationally going forward. But I also think that this is in part a conversation about process and accountability and perhaps there is a means through the sub-regional, at the sub-regional level, to ensure that there are greater mechanisms with respect to accountability uh, and, and clearer processes to, in order to then achieve uh, at, the, at the regional level itself. Great, thank you. We've got a question from uh, Greg Brown, and Greg is asking about the Australian, Kiwi, and French interests in voting for the Polynesian candidate. Uh, Greg wonders aloud, was there a frac was the fracture due to a miscalculation or, or may have Australia and New Zealand and France coordinated to sideline the United States? Uh, it, it's an interesting question, and I think also was a piece, reflects a piece written uh, by Cleo Pascal in The Diplomat as well, wondering if there isn't uh, some other sort of fracture going on uh, behind the scenes. And would anyone like to talk about uh, the Australian, New Zealand, and French views on um, on the PIF and uh, who they're back, who they backed, and why. I'll, I'll jump in there for a second. I can't speak to all of these, um, but just worth noting that New Caledonia didn't vote uh, in this recent right. uh, in the recent decision making uh, due to what was happening domestically. Uh, in New Caledonia, so perhaps can then speak to um, to Australia and uh, and New Zealand uh, interests. Uh, we as again, as I said before, it's a it was a secret ballot. We don't know. Um, there's been a great deal of discussion and um, going back and forwards, as you can imagine, uh, with respect to who voted for who and and some excellent minds across the Pacific offering perspectives on who Australia and New Zealand voted for, but we simply don't know. And it has remained a, a very tightly and, and rightly held, uh, held um, decision by Canberra and Wellington. We cannot assume that they necessarily voted as a block, but again, it would be surprising in many respects um, for there to be significant divergence between the two uh, countries. What it does tell us perhaps is um, if they, if if Australia and New Zealand voted uh, for for um, Henry Puna, then that match that may indicate um, uh, some obvious uh, um, comfort uh, with having a Cook Islands um, uh, leader um, as Secretary General, uh, kind of locates a degree of power in the South, uh, although I don't want to overplay that too much, obviously, um, and, and certainly a degree of comfort uh, with having, with having uh, Puna as Secretary General, a known, a known entity, um, particularly to New Zealand, uh, but also to Australia. Whether or not, as we don't know who they voted for, we, we can't necessarily tell whether or not this was a miscalculation or not. What happens now, obviously, is incredibly important. And this is, again, a role for um, both uh, perhaps for New Zealand and Australia uh, to engage in some serious shuttle diplomacy uh, across the region to, um, to support the building of bridges. But I think it's, it, it's, it's fundamentally important, and this perhaps ties into the, to the other question, this previous question as well, that both Australia and New Zealand obviously need to be very careful in seeking to drive agendas in the Pacific Islands Forum. That has happened in the past uh, and, uh, and there have been 
uh, various issues that have arisen as a consequence. And, and certainly that diversification of foreign policy partners um, was part of that, part of that frustration around uh, New Zealand and Australia driving agendas, which dates right back to, to um, obviously to 1971 and the Lay Rebellion led by Ratamara. So there is a strong sense there that, that um, whatever the outcome, certainly it's in both New Zealand and Australia's interests for uh, regional unity to um, to go forward uh, and this is perhaps an opportunity to to learn um, a great deal about how those sub-regional dynamics are playing out and, and cannot be ignored. Anna, can I stay with you for just a second? I just want to follow up on, on that. Um, Dominic Godfrey of our Radio NZ Pacific has asked you to, to reflect a little bit on the PIF architecture in the coming year. And he's wondering a bit about um, how do you see things going over the next year that may lead to better reflect to, to better reflect equal representation of subregions and therefore see the Micronesians return? What, do you, what would you anticipate to happen in the next year? This is well, looking at the crystal ball a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough question. A lot of this depends on what comes. Well, firstly, a lot of this depends on the 2050 um, strategy and the review of regional architecture. Um, and a lot of that depends on who's driving that uh, and who's supporting it and how much buy-in that that has across the region. So I think it's too early to say what the regional architecture will necessarily look like over the next 12 months. I think that it's not necessarily going to change very fast, but I think hopefully we will see some of those conversations to start happening, um, and they already are happening in a number of quarters, uh, to address these issues that the concerns that the Micronesian member states um, have, the concerns that a number of member states have about how about decision making uh, and those processes and accountability um, in the region. So I think a lot of this hinges on the review of the regional architecture and the buy-in across the region of key leaders and individuals uh, as part of that. And hopefully the Micronesian states will be part of that conversation as well, because obviously there's a great deal to learn there and to listen to. Great, thank you. Um, I, I have a, a Georgetown student, uh, Henry Westerman, has asked a question about, um, about uh, he's really wondering what does face-to-face -face diplomacy deliver that the digital diplomacy can't? And he leads me to wonder a little bit about a theme that has been replicated several times in the media uh, a constraint on the negotiations uh, over implementing the quote gentleman's agreement, which was living by Zoom. We're in a COVID, COVID environment. We're talking to one another today in little tiny boxes. And, you know, it's been put forward by a number of commentators, leaders and others who have said, you know, trying to do things through Zoom has really constrained our ability to really work our way through what should have been a consensus agreement. I was wondering, would anyone like to reflect a little bit on, on the impact of Zoom and how it impinges on regional multilateral diplomacy in the Pacific? Just jump in. <laughs> Can I make one point? But then I think perhaps if we hand it over to Ambassador Zakius to, <laughs> to make some comments on it. Sure, go for it. Um, from an outsider's perspective, uh, um, the danger here is that Zoom can can silo um, countries. It can create a sense of 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 of, of national a false sort of nationalism and silo that, and and it creates a disconnect, and it can reinforce those disconnects. Ambassador, I, th I think I think you've been called upon. <laughs> Thank you, Anna, for throwing me into the lions uh, then. But uh, but uh, you know, um, as a as a diplomat, uh, you know, I, I see that um, Zoom is convenient, but there is nothing that uh, replaces uh, human face to face contact. Of course, this is uh, face to face, but it's not in the sense of when you're uh, across someone. I think there is. There's an element that is missing that Zoom cannot uh, you know, uh, provide, but uh, that's that's an important, and we really certainly look forward to the opportunity when we can 
revisit that because that in in the in the Pacific way, that is how a lot of a lot of decisions are made by 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 coming together, uh, meeting in the as we spoke earlier with Thursdays, the Dalanoa session, you know, uh, over a cobble, uh, and Zoom, you cannot do that. Uh, you cannot do that uh, human interaction. So that would be my comment. Zoom certainly removes much of the informality and the relaxed nature of face-to-face -face communication. Ambassador McGann, I was wondering if, if we could uh, t ask you to, to comment on, on Zoom and diplomacy. Well, thank you, Alan. Let, let me comment on it in this way. I, I think uh, Zoom and social media may lend itself to the spread of uh, conspiracy theories and false agendas because we don't have that same type of engagement. Uh, I, it, it, I always find it remarkable that in people describing uh, how the United States deals, for instance, with the North Pacific, in my time in the State Department, I cannot ever recall when the United States actually intervened in any foreign policy decision made by one of the freely associated states, all right? Uh, and, and yet you have um, scholars, politicians, whatever, somehow attributing uh, to the United States uh, actions and behaviors that may not have existed, all right? And so in those type of uh, assessments can, I think, move very quickly uh, through social media. Uh, there may not have been a broader agenda as to the outcome of the vote uh, uh, in the PIF, uh, but the one problem that we have since we've never had a clear enunciation of why not a Secretary General from the North Pacific, it lended itself to, is there some broader agenda? Right. There may not have been, you know, a, a discussion in Noumea, uh, Wellington, uh, and um, Canberra as to who was going to be the next Secretary General uh, of the PIF. And I assure you, uh, I said Noumea because I don't think Paris cared one way or the other. So uh, I, I think we have to be careful of not allowing uh, social media to allow us to very quickly uh, spread theories uh, or assumptions, which may or may not be true. Uh, but in fact, I think uh, if we had just gotten an answer to the question from the countries of the North Pacific to why not, we would mm -hmm. be having this discussion today. Right. And thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, uh, Jerry, did you want to comment? <laughs> Uh, just just uh, what was going through my mind is if, if and I, I am a strong believer in face-to-face -face diplomacy and uh, the power of being able to look someone in the eye or uh, sit over a bowl of kava and uh, have a, a nice long discussion. But having said that, if this was something that could be resolved face-to-face, -face, why didn't that happen in Funafuti? Why did the decision get delayed? And uh, that would speak to the fact that just how difficult this, this has been uh, for, for the region. And obviously if there was an easy uh, or facile uh, answer that it would have been put on the table uh, long ago. Hmm. Uh, and and I, I think the resolution of this will require uh, more than a dozen Zoom meetings. It's going to require a lot of people to get out and uh, go to various parts of the region and sit down and have long conversations in much the same way that uh, Ratu Mara did back in uh, 1970, 71, I guess, when uh, PNG wanted to join the Pacific Islands Forum, but they weren't yet an independent state. Uh, so that would, might have been uh, early 70s. And, and Ratu Mara went and uh, spoke with the leadership in PNG and said, uh, I assure you that once you do become independent, you can be part of the forum. And it forged a very uh, strong working relationship between Fiji and PNG, uh, one that does not exist today. Well, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I just looking at the time and we, we've, we've gone four minutes past our allotted hour. So I just want to thank our speakers, Ambassador Gerald Zakios, Ambassador Steve McGann,
Dr. Jerry Finnan and, and Anna Poles from um, New Zealand. Thank you all so much for your, uh, your contributions today. This event was uh, streamed on YouTube for those who are wondering and uh, will be available uh, for viewing at a later time. I just need to do a little bit of editing. So thank you so much for joining us and I wish you all farewell. Good night.